Hi, this is Greg Fraser. And I'm Oren Sofer, and you're listening to The Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to The Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. Uh, here we are in webcam glory. Look oh, no. This. this is the room I've been doing this in all this time? Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Yes, we, we are doing a, a, a video episode of the podcast. Maybe this will be a thing. Maybe uh, We've had enough requests uh, from people God, who I wanted hope to not. do this. Ugh. Hey, uh, who's on the show today? Uh, it's very, very exciting. We, we've had a, hundreds of people on the show at this point. And, uh, yeah. and if, it's, uh, if, if, if we're shooting a TV series, sometimes we'll have two DPs who shoot the same series. But we've never had two DPs who shot the same movie. And today we have uh, Greg Fraser and Oren Sofer, who are both credited DPs on Gareth Edwards' The Creator, which is a gorgeous, amazing sci-fi epic. Uh, I, I can't say enough good things about it. it. It looks great. And we've had Greg on the show uh, a few times before, and uh, I find him to be one of the most interesting and innovative DPs working today. Uh, one won the Oscar. I, I off mic. I, I congratulated for him for winning the Oscar for Dune, which he did since the last time we talked to him. And then Oren, uh, you know, I think has really proved that, that he's really something special on this movie. And you know, he's got a great body of work be before that. I hope to have him on a bunch of times as well because uh, this movie's really unique. I'm excited that something like this exists. I'm a big fan of uh, Gareth Edwards, and I'm glad to see that. He's making original stuff. Yeah, in theaters now. You can go see The Creator right now. Uh, you can see it in, in multiple formats, and it looks great. Be beyond everything else, it is a great-looking movie. So And so, yeah. and camera nerds, yes, we talk about it. Yes, we do. We get we get into the weeds, and we talk about camera and VFX and all kinds of stuff. And Maybe a little that... more technical than a lot of episodes, but I don't think it's technical to the point where people aren't going to be able to follow the conversation no. if they aren't techies themselves. Uh, I think it's a really wonderful conversation. It'll be coming up in just a few minutes, but first... Close focus. Something kind of interesting happening this week in the industry. Coming Friday, Ben, you want to tell our listeners? And our, now our viewers. <laughs> our viewers. Hey, that means that Ben Katz has to add clips. Enjoy that, Ben Katz. Yeah, So great. there's a movie coming out in theaters this week, and it's an almost three-hour concert movie from Taylor Swift on her Eras tour. It is already breaking all the records. And it yeah. will break even more records. With it's, this movie. it's it's noteworthy on on a lot of fronts. Uh, you know, obviously uh, Taylor Swift's concert tour itself broke tons of records, and uh, you know, uh, some say bolstered the economy. And uh, this movie, it, it's it's an interesting story. Uh, and I heard this first uh, from uh, the podcast "The Town" with Matt Bellamy talking about it. But it's uh, it's self financed and self distributed, so that means that this movie, which I'm going to casually, you, you want to do an over under here? I'm going to say this movie's going to make $150 million. What do you say? $150 million, You mean for the opening weekend? Theatrically. Just like in, in its theatrical run. You only think it's going to make $150 million. Oh, oh that's I, a good point. I, yeah. You I think it's, it's going to make it $150 million opening weekend. I, I'm quite confident because it's already made a hundred million in pre-sale tickets. So I don't know if they're all for crap. the opening weekend. Yeah, yeah there's been a hundred million in sales before the movie, like like just in pre-sales. That is that has shattered all the records. Okay. Well, every, I, I, I yeah. would I would say let's do another take and let me correct myself. But I'm going to let my idiocy uh, stand. And, and I will say that I was saying like I think this is going to be a pretty successful concert movie. But I I, I think you're right. This is going to be successful as movie. a movie. Like this oh, yeah. could be successful on, and you know, sometimes we'll talk about like the, you know, pop stars of old, like Prince and Michael Jackson and stuff. And I think we don't really make those anymore, but you look at somebody like Taylor Swift or somebody like Beyonce, and you can't argue that they're not every bit as big as any other uh, recording artist who's ever lived. But, the, but again, the interesting thing about this is they self finance this and then mm -hmm. they chose to not go with a traditional distributor and they are self distributing this film so that means that you know minus whatever there's going to be some kind of distribution fees or whatever and i'm sure that they're using vendors to get f files here and there hither and yon like one person can't manage all this but they're going to make most of the box office 
That's right. So uh, essentially, this is four walling it. They are renting the theaters. And it's not just a few theaters. It's like 8,500 screens in 100 countries. So all around the world, this movie is dropping. And that sheer number of screens, I can't even comprehend what that's going to mean then for per per screen revenue and total revenue. But her worldwide appeal is undeniable. She's a huge, she's you know, one of the biggest pop stars of all time. Well, also, now, also think about repeat yeah. viewings in theaters. No. Yeah, People absolutely. who saw this concert are going to go see it in the theater. They're going to bring their friends and they're probably going to go back and see it again. It would not surprise me. I think that Taylor Swift might, we might be on the verge. I'm not going to say like a theatrical renaissance. I think that this might, you know, and it's it's a little bit of a secret thing now too because it's, you know, it's, it's documentary. It's a concert film. It's not a traditional movie, but I think it's going to be super, super huge. I could be wrong. I could be eating my words, but I think that the Swift army is going to show up in a really, really All big right. way. So that, glo- global yeah. box office, billion dollars? Uh, eventually, absolutely. I think opening weekend, definitely not. Definitely not. I think that, oh, yeah. that's, no one's that's ever too, made a billion dollars in yeah, one weekend. That, that but I don't, let me tell you, I don't think that the capacity, especially given that it's three hours, they can only run it so many times in the day. Exactly right. It's going to be on a lot of screens, but it can only run so many times. There's going to be a limiting factor. Uh, I, I are you going to go see it? I hadn't planned on it, but. Something tells me that the experience of seeing this in a theater with like hardcore fans might be something kind of amazing. It might actually be like the type of movie like if I was in Los Angeles right now, if I was in, you know, at at like the if it was showing on the big screen at the Chinese theater, absolutely I would go. Because even though I am not a hardcore Taylor Swift fan, I think that being there and having that experience surrounded by those people might be amazing. Might be just like absolutely mind blowing. I feel like I would walk into that theater and suddenly the average age would skyrocket to 23. That, that's, that's to 23. That's <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people yeah. in there. So like I don't really move the average that much. I, I understand. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get to our interview here with Greg Fraser and Oren Sofer. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. All right, so uh, we're here. This is actually a first for us at the Cinematography Podcast to have two cinematographers who worked on the same movie. We've had plenty who worked on the same television series, but they would have different episodes. This is uh, two DPs, uh, Greg Fraser, who we've had on the show before, and Oren Sofer, who this is your first time. Welcome, Oren, uh, who shot the amazing science fiction movie, uh, The Creator, for director Gareth Edwards. Uh, thank you both for coming on the show. Yeah, cool. thanks. thanks for having us. Really, really uh, amazing stuff. Uh, And I want to, out of the gate, we want to kind of clear out the hack questions that we need to ask first, the low-hanging fruit. And the big one is we've never talked to anyone on a movie where there were two cinematographers on a movie. So I kind of wanted to know what necessitated that. How did you work together? What was the communication? I think I know the answer, but I kind of want to hear the, you know, the, the, the story of how this came about. Well, if if I can start, effectively it was a um, it was a pragmatic choice at the very very beginning because I had a conflict. Let's say uh, June two was coming up, and I had a conflict with that as a so I couldn't actually be able to do both jobs at the same time. But beyond that, there was actually more of a practical, less pragmatic reason to to have two cinematographers. So you know, Gareth is very much a um, a determined director, and he he operates his own cameras. But there's a lot of stuff that he needs assistance with. Like he's, you know, he's not lighting his own sets and he's not, uh, you know, hiring his own crew and he's not running the gimbals and the rigs. Like he's not building those things, even though he probably would love to. It's just impractical for him to be up at 4 a.m. putting together a a rig for the morning shoot. So what he needs is he needs good, solid support. So because I wasn't able to be there in Thailand – I felt like I needed to give him some support that that run ran beyond just a, a lighting technician, because you know e- even though we we probably you know our, our chief lighting technician for this film was fantastic, I felt like I needed actually another DP. And the thing is that the weight of a DP's name, you know, not the, sorry, not the, the name itself, but their their title, their role, mm-hmm. meant that it sort of allowed the, the hierarchy of the film set to to remain intact. Because if suddenly there was no DP, in inverted commas, on set, then I f- feel like there could have been a bit of a, uh, a, a I wouldn't say a power vacuum because it sounds really, uh, <laughs> it sounds very very dodgy, but there, there could very well have been people who have 
who are vying to try and fill that 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 role and not well, vying yeah, again in that, a, in a, in a negative sense. way it yeah. makes total sense that like yeah if there isn't somebody doing that is it going to be the gaffer is it going to like who's going to come in and start act, performing that role right and exactly. who do you go to exactly. for questions you know like who do you yeah. go to when you know the ad or the producers or somebody has a question in that department like they're yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. exactly so so it felt very much like we needed you know when i was working with jim and who was our producer and gareth on on how we could solve this problem we decided sort of very early on that that person needed to be a DP in their own right. The good thing about that, like I said, is that it allowed there to be one voice on set and one person to be approached for all those things that uh, that, that occur on a day-to-day basis and to be able to give Gareth that support. So, like, there was significant choices that we made to make sure that the, the film was looked after, that the director was supported and looked after. So, from, from my perspective, that's the reason and the rationale behind having two DPs. You know, and, and Aaron can talk to this a little bit as well, but the benefit of the two DPs was that, and I experienced this on Mandalorian, by the way, and I loved working on the Mandalorian because I got to collab with with Baz, my, my DP on that. And that was the same situation, even though you might see the, the credits and go, okay, this was DP'd by Greg Fraser, episode one, three, and whatever the ones that I, that I, I can't even remember now, which is, that's how irrelevant it is. Mm-hmm. But but we worked we very much worked together on the Mandalorian. You know, mm-hmm. he, he would be on set some days, leading that set on 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 an episode that I was officially shooting, and I would be going and and working on material for his episode. So it was very much a collab. And so to that point, that's kind of how I felt like Oren and I worked really well. You know, and, and were able to kind of collaborate. I mean, that to me was the biggest enjoyment for the whole show. Actually, it was the collaboration. Yeah, were, it was for were the two too. of you on set at the same time. We, we reconvened in London at the end. So uh, we, we shot at Pinewood for a couple of weeks and we were able to, to sort of reunite, um, which was, was quite nice. But, uh, but no, I was, I was on the ground in Thailand and uh, Greg was a remote, um, but, but we would talk all the time, pretty much every day. You know, I would, I would bother him with, uh, I don't know, questions <laughs> about like upcoming lighting setups, consultations, but also just keeping an eye on the dailies and sending stills and, and, and everything. And really the close, the closest part of the collaboration was in prep was was really the three of us greg gareth and myself like all aligning about how gareth wanted to make the film the conversations that he and greg had already been having before i came on board um and then also just figuring out gareth's taste you know like ultimately that was the big thing was what does he like what is he looking for what does he need how can we make sure that we're creating the environment to make the film that he wants to make and to have it look the way that he wants it to look um, so that was the big part of it, but the collaboration was the best part of it for me too. I mean, one of the funniest questions that I've been getting, uh, not in interviews, but just from, from random people is sort of like, wait, so what footage did you shoot and what footage did Greg shoot? And it's sort of like Greg was just saying with Mandalorian, like it didn't work that way. It, it, it's not a question of, you know, shooting different sections of the film because, Gareth was operating the camera the whole time. I mean, who's making the decisions about, you know, where the camera's going and what's in, what what the lens is pointing at? Like, Gareth is in control of mm-hmm. the physical camera, right? So it, it begs this even larger question of, like, the way that people think about what a cinematographer does, I think, is just can be very literal sometimes. But the truth is, is that the role is actually this, like, broader thing. And it, it, was, it was it's about supporting the director and supporting what the director needs. And in this case, we had a very specific director with specific needs and a specific vision, not just in terms of the look of a project, but how we're going to make the project. And it was our job really just to support that and to understand it and to be a part of it and to be a part of that process. And, and that was really it. And to create the lighting environments, to create the environments for Gareth to, to be able to shoot the film the way that he wanted to and to give the actors the space and Gareth the space. It's a, it's a really interesting, it's a very interesting discussion to have about what the role of a cinematographer is. And, and I think we should, as a community, be having that conversation in the future. Because philosophically, yeah. we, we we need to define it. And I think this is really important going forward with with a lot more work in, in 3D, with a lot more work in mm-hmm. animation. Like, like, can I say, let's ask you now, does the cinematographer have to be touching the camera? No. Does the cinematographer have to be commanding a crew? No. Does a cinematographer... There's a lot of things that you could answer no to about the role of a cinematographer like does a cinematographer need to be directing the lighting i don't know do they 
physically? I don't, I don't know. Like, so, <laughs> so philosophically, it's a discussion that we've we had a lot of. And what was enjoyable for me was the fact that we could, like, you know, there there are things that they could not do when they were on set. They could not review their footage in a theater. You know, when they're sitting in a in a village in Thailand, they could not review footage in the theater. But I yeah. could because I was in Los Angeles. Yeah. I think I was prepared, you know, preparing June at that point in time. And and I could review with our colorist, Dave Cole, I could review the footage. And it just meant that, that the two two brains worked better than one brain because we both had different opportunities to support Gareth. It, yeah. So, you know, Oren was there on the ground solving day-to-day issues with the minutia. During the shoot, I was able to be to stand back from it. I was able to review footage and talk to Oren about you know, Lutz, you know, was how's the exposure going? Take into account certain things. Maybe Gareth's monitor was feeling a little bit bright. Therefore, he was deliberately aiming for stuff that was too dark or darker. And do we have to adjust? Like all those, all those conversations. So I was supporting Oren and Oren was supporting me. It was very, very much that collaboration, which, which is I would do again in a heartbeat because I think it's enjoyable. Absolutely. It sounds to me like the collaboration, communication and prep work that the three of you did together ended up being a huge benefit and plus for the way this movie ended up working and ended up getting made. It sounds to me like you were able to um, delegate in a way that you just physically wouldn't be able to do when it had to be one person, the way it traditionally is, one person who's running all the departments and handling all the prep and doing all the work. You know, you you collabed and had a team. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, it, forced, it forced a conversation that was enjoyable to have really. And that was, okay, so we all know how Garrett's going to operate and how do we best give him what he needs. And and that isn't necessarily just standing on set and lighting a shot. That is making sure that the crew that is standing outside the door has the same mindset. So it's about running the crew, about making sure that they're on the same, everybody needs to be on the same page. You've got to make sure that you your compromises are very deliberately chosen Back to the camera situation, you know, like what happens when you choose a camera, a traditional film camera, even though an Alexa Mini is small, it pushes everything larger. It means mm-hmm. the gimbal you're on is larger. It means that you, you need a different type of follow focus system. Uh, you know, therefore that becomes bigger. Everything just increases and increases. So you've got to make sure that your dogma is super focused and super um, like very clear to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I can also say from from the experience of the DP on set, like that job can be very isolating. You know, it can be very lonely to be the DP. Um, And I'm not I'm not trying to score sympathy points like, oh, poor (laughs) cinematographers, you know, like us and our are stuck with our thoughts and our heads. But it really there is something really special about having another brain that you can share all this stuff with. And it's not just all on you. And you can bounce bounce ideas off of off of uh, the other DP. And I can ask Greg, like, oh, you know, we have this uh, night exterior that I'm really worried about. And, and you know, you've, you've been in this situation before. Like, wh- what can we pull from from past experience that isn't just me in my own head? Um, and then also getting feedback, you know, like you're not just um, up constantly uh, – I don't know, self-criticizing or or regretting decisions. Like there's another pair of eyes and there's another person that you're sort of just able to share all that with. And and I thought it was really beautiful. I mean, it's a very egoless process in 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 the best way possible. Like, and I think that just led to better creativity, honestly, that collaboration. I'm just gonna summarize what I just heard you both say, but it sounds like the dividing and conquering of the tasks ultimately made for a much better experience and perhaps less stress on the day, day in and day out, because you had the brain trust, because you had the ability to bounce these ideas back and forth. Mm. Yeah. Is that, is that still something? a little bit of stress, but yeah. you know, yeah. the normal amount. I didn't amount. say no stress. I said less yeah, yeah. stress. Just le- le- yes, less hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I think they also, I also think it improves the, improves the end result as well. I, I think yeah. that the film, the film looks, the film could have been, I mean, let's, let's be, let's be real. With, with Gareth wanting to approach this the way you wanted to approach it, the film, film could have looked very plain and very basic. You know, it could have been without the right lighting and stewardship of the, of the images in Thailand, it could have been very tough to watch because mm. Gareth was concentrating on his coverage and his shots. We needed to make sure that it had a speciality to it and it needed to feel and look great, which 
was the overriding brief was that it could not look like a documentary. It had to feel like a film. It had mm-hmm. to have the approach of a documentary. We, we, you know, we had to be lucky on every single scenario. We had to walk into every single set and be lucky, which doesn't doesn't happen without careful planning, of course. Yeah. Exactly. So it's interesting because to mm-hmm. me, it's like of all his films, this most reminds me of his first film, Monsters. Yeah. I'm, yes. And and that's and that deliberate. approach. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And, and I think that that dovetails into even, you know, the choice of the camera that you guys did. Yeah. You know, went with, I, which I, is, which is the other elephant in the room. <laughs> yes. The, yes. the elephant in the room that Ben's referring to, um, you know, uh, it was over a year ago, Greg, that you dropped on this podcast. Don't yeah. remind me. Don't <laughs> remind me. Did you get in trouble? <laughs> I don't think you got I, in trouble because it didn't get picked up anywhere until just a few months ago. And then it's I, a, I, a really big deal. I, don't worry. I kicked my own ass many times. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh. my, our, our, friend, all, our friend yeah. Subi Mohammed will not stop asking me, peppering me questions about it. Like he, he was, he, he was asking me and I was like, all I know is what's in the interview, dude. <laughs> like uh, we didn't uh, cut right. anything out. So, so, so here's the thing since various uh, YouTubers and bloggers have, uh, have picked up the story and decided to run with it. Uh, I feel like um, there's two sort of main points of contention out there, and I, I'll, I'll get into them re- real quickly here by way of this question. And uh, the two main points are this for to catch anyone up who has stayed out of this, mercifully stayed out of the, the, the conversations <laughs> that are going on. Uh, number one is vitriol. Uh, there are some people who seem to be personally offended that you didn't choose an objectively higher performance camera than the camera that that you that you chose. Uh, that that's that's one. Uh, number two is uh, particularly in the YouTube community, it seems like there's a bunch of people who've latched onto this to say. Mm. Everybody, you're you're out of excuses. If this is good enough for Hollywood, it's good mm. enough for you. What's holding you back? Now, I understand the arguments that both but both of these sort of like factions are making. And I would say early in my career, I might have prescribed actually to to one or both. But today I wholeheartedly reject both completely. And actually part of the reason I reject them is because of a conversation I had with the late great cinematographer uh, who uh, was taken away from us long before his time, Neil Fredericks. Neil Fredericks mm. um, was the first person, uh, I worked as an AC for him back in the early 2000s. And he really instilled in me that the format that you absolutely, that the format of choice, your camera, your film stock, whatever it might be, uh, should be serving the story the best that it possibly can. And you're choosing the right tool for the job and not trying to force something else to work outside of what its inherent nature is and what if, what it's what's it's bringing to the table. Because if you're working with something that's above what you need, then you're having to like force it down. You're having to force it into a space. And if you're working something below, you're always trying to like eke out everything. And we were on a mixed format movie that was shooting film and also DV. And a couple times I was like, why are we doing this DV stuff? This DV does not feel like it's it it's going to work as well in post. And he was like Trust me, you got it all wrong. This is exactly right for what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be DV. Mm-hmm. He was the first person who really instilled in me that um, the maximum benefit comes from the correct format. And really, once you've got that, you're not having to reinvent anything along the way. It's going to inherently give you what it it can give you. And I feel like if the if the absolute best camera for what you were doing was the FX3, then any other choice that you made would have been actually, you know, in some ways taking away from the look and the benefits and the operability and everything that went into that. So in my opinion, it it is the absolute most perfect camera that you could have chosen for it. Mm. And to bring anything else into that would have compromised you in one way or another i mean uh, what 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 is your what's what's your read on this do you do you mm-hmm. want do you want to weigh into these waters at all <laughs> yeah i'd love to hear Aaron, love to hear because Aaron very much was there on a day-to-day basis with that and yes he can talk to the fact that the, the process of the way that gareth wanted to make a movie had to occur with this particular form factor camera yeah yeah exactly i mean if you watch any behind the scenes footage from the film that's that's out there you can see a lot of shots of gareth in action with the camera and the way that he moves and the way that he shot the film would not be possible with anything larger than a dslr you know mirrorless form factor camera like that's sort of just the reality of it is 
the, 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 the approach to the film, the multiple rigs that we needed to have ready at all times to be able to quickly switch from a gimbal shot to a crane, to a dolly, to a drone, to handheld. Like that's how Gareth likes to move. That's how he likes to work. Anything that slows that process down is a waste of our already limited budget. And, you know, we're, we've traveled thousands of miles to these exotic locations and you're going to maximize every single minute of that time. Um, mm. and, 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 and take advantage of every freedom and every opportunity given from the way that we lit the film, the way that we set up the approach that Gareth had total flexibility and freedom to move, to find his shots, to explore and discover, um, the coverage with his actors and all of that. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I'll throw it back to Greg at the end to actually talk about the, the testing process and, and how they landed on the FX3, because that was, that was a decision that was made before I came on board. But from my perspective, it's like, once you answer one question, you're good to go. And that one question is, can this camera deliver a quality image at the you know level that is required for, for what we need? We need to be able to color grade the footage, and ILM needs to be able to add visual effects. So is the ProRes RAW format, the 4K ProRes RAW that you can get out of that camera, robust enough? for that work. And once the answer is yes, then you've answered the only question that's relevant is like, hmm. am I compromising anything technically by shooting on this camera to a degree that would impact the film negatively? And if the answer is no, then the camera's good enough. And the truth is we live in a very fortunate time right now. There's so many great tools that are at our disposal and, there's, and they're capable of so much, especially in the prosumer world. And I think that a lot of people are just sort of falling for the marketing of prosumer and and sort of the the mental barrier that is placed when you market cameras a certain way. And you know, I fell for it too. Like the first time I heard that that's what we were shooting on before I I didn't even know about the camera. I knew nothing about it. I was like, "Oh, really? That's interesting." And then all it all it takes is one trip to Photochem to look at the test footage, and then you're like, "Oh, that's what the camera can shoot? Okay. Cool. I had no idea." Great, good to know. Done. I will never think about that again, you know? <laughs> and um, and and then the other truth is, and Gareth has mentioned this in other interviews, is like, this was the the camera that existed in 2022 that is capable of this. And and a year from now and two years from now, there might be something better. There might be something that solves some of the, you know, issues that we had to deal with that were all kind of logistical issues of using a camera with that form factor that isn't designed to be necessarily shot in this way, like it only has an HDMI out. There's no SDI. We had to figure out wireless video workflow. We had to figure out time code sync. We had to figure out like all these things. And by we, I mean the the Thai camera team, team and and yeah. and yeah. Photocam. And I, I give them so much credit. But yeah, so that's the thing is that the, the tools will continue to evolve, and I think it'll just it'll only benefit us to be open to it and to push for stuff like that. Like Fuji just released the GFX two. Um, mm -hmm. with all this yeah. improved video capability and, and I got to see it the other day and it's incredible. And you're like, wow, this is a really amazing, another amazing option. And it, it can do the same thing. It can record raw to an external recorder and you're like, amazing, cool. Another really cool. And the, the sensor size on that camera is quite unique. So, Massive. you know, now yes. this has right. just unlocked a whole other world of, of potential creativity. But, um, yeah, that's, that's maybe sort of the, my big picture reaction to all of it. But, um, yeah, I mean. One of the things that we had to get over were, was this preconceptions that Aaron just talked about, about something being in this price bracket, therefore it means something. And, and I've encountered this a little bit over the last few films that I've done where, you know, on the Batman we, we used, for the chase sequence, we used a lot of rehoused Soviet glass from iron glass. They, they helped us out a lot by rehousing and re-gearing glass and, and oval irises and stuff. And effectively, the decision that we made on that film was to to use these lenses because we didn't have enough lenses of our own. They couldn't, you know, like there wasn't enough lenses in the set of alphas to give them a whole set and I didn't want to risk them. And there was a very good reason to do that. And then when it got to, say, shooting the actors in that sequence, I was having this conversation with Danny Villa, who was my second unit DP, and he goes, well, you sure we don't use the alphas on, on Rob and the, the, the Penguin? And I said, no. I, we should use the same lenses, even though they're $80 bits of glass. Like, as long as they work for my focus ball, they should work. Again, there's a mental barrier. There's a huge yeah. mental barrier that people have when it comes to the cost of something versus the value that it gives. Mm. And, you know, back in the old days, let's say even 20 years ago when I was when I started, 
Yes, the difference between a film camera price and the difference between a VHS camera or a, or a PD one one hundred or like those old DV cams, massive difference in yeah. price mm. and massive difference in quality. Um, but right now, you can't tell me that there's a massive difference in quality that that justifies. I won't say justifies because I'm not going to throw my all the, these companies out to pasture. Like getting past that that juncture of well, it's just a three thousand dollar camera. It, mm. it doesn't matter i mean the whole film hinges the whole system of the film hinges on the ability to shoot with a camera like that now as Oren said that was 2022 right now if we were doing it again would we use the fx3 don't know we would test it maybe the gfx 100 is the way to go maybe yeah. the, the there's a new fx3 isn't there there's a smaller more lightweight fx3 i think mm-hmm. yeah there. yeah yeah exactly and it ultimately goes back to Ilya, what you were saying is that it's the right tool for the right job that's all that matters. And 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 the way that the film was shot, the way that the film was made necessitated something that small and that lightweight. And that's ultimately what it came down to, at least initially. It was the search for the camera that is that form factor. I mean, Gareth shot a test film th- that he used to pitch the movie to the studio. And this was years ago, pre-pandemic. And he traveled around by himself with Jim, the producer, uh, just the two of them. And they traveled around a few countries in Southeast Asia. It was ostensibly a location scout, and it was, but it was also a footage gathering mission. Uh, and he shot on a Nikon DSLR. I don't, I don't remember which one, but um, Nikon DSLR on a little handheld gimbal. And the shots look beautiful. I mean, it looks like Baraka. It's like smooth, slow oh, nice. dollies through like mm-hmm. the most beautiful naturally lit vistas. There's no lighting. It's completely just on location documentary footage. And then they brought that footage to ILM. They added visual effects on top of it. They added the sci-fi. The sound design team added the sound effects. It was basically a test of the methodology of the film. Like we can reverse engineer the look. We can reverse engineer the the sci-fi and the and the scope and add it to very simply captured footage. And I think that was the catalyst. He was like, I need to be able to make the whole movie this way, essentially. And so that was the search of a camera that was that form factor. And actually, some of shots from that Nikon are in the movie. It's actually quite wow. a few of them from that ori- oh, wow. original. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's shots from the original scout in the film. There's shots from some of our location scouts in the film. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in there. It's it's great. I think it's fun. I think it's, uh, I, I, and again, like Greg was saying, like I think people would be hard-pressed to point out which, one, which ones are which. I mean, it's just a few things peppered throughout, like you would never know. But, you know, it's just kind of a testament to where things are. There was, there was a couple of things we could not use the FX3 for. Like, we... Technically, again, uh, this is where it comes back to kind of saying, well, getting a camera that's a professional camera yeah. gives you a lot more options. So we couldn't use the FX3 when Virtual we shot on the volume because, yeah, because we couldn't sync it to the to the, to the the screen. So yeah. we mm. had to go to the FX9 for that. So that was a bit of a compromise uh, because, you know, we'd, we'd got all, all of our systems in place and working and then suddenly we had to change cameras, which meant that a bit of a rethink on on the rigging side of things in London. So, you know, there were some things it couldn't do, but frankly, the camera could do a lot. And I mean, I'm not going to sit here and sell the camera because I, I can't stand it when films talk about how something was shot before you see it. Yes. I think it is the least, it's the least relevant bit of bullshit that, that, that exists. Like it's exactly the same as me telling you what was for craft service each day. Because it's, <laughs> it, it, means, it means nothing. Yeah, it's it means zero. nothing, less than nothing. It's like, do you respond to the? Do you respond to the image? Do you respond to the film? Um, all those other factors, the the thousand things before what was it shot on, is the most are the most important things. Whenever we talk about like novel approaches to filmmaking, and like this goes way back, but you know, like like you talk about the Dogma ninety five filmmakers and how they threw threw everything away. We had Anthony Dodd Mantle on the show once, and and to me, like the lesson of Dogma wasn't shoot everything on a handheld. Two hundred dollar mini DV camcorder. The the lesson was throw out your preconceptions and do this in a different way. And Greg, if I may, like I feel like between you know being one of the innovators of do of using LED volumes and and doing a film out on Dune and then recapturing it, like I feel like you're someone who's always looking at this stuff in a way that isn't isn't the same old same old, and and you're willing to approach it in a in a new and innovative way. So it's it's not the the gimmick like when steven soderbergh did full frontal and he and there are all those pictures of him rocking a, an xl1 uh until we saw the film it's more like oh okay like how can we use these tools in a, in a more interesting and innovative way to get 
the world class images that that you're trying to get. I mean, that that's how how I took it anyway. Well, I, I, listen, I think I would agree. I do enjoy mixing it up in the sense that there are some things we do on a film set that are very it's very frustrating. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why systems are in place because it means you can go to any country in the world, you can hire a gaffer, they know what their job is. Like it's it's universal. Our jobs, our focus puller pretty much does the same thing worldwide. So that's it that's important that there is this sort of base standard level. But unfortunately, with that base standard comes learned knowledge of things that maybe aren't correct or were correct 20 or 30 years ago about how to pull focus or, or what, what type of grip equipment do you need to get a smooth, steady dolly shot? You know, like you don't need mm. the same gear now that you had 20 years ago because you can stabilize it it with a gimbal or in post or there are things you can do that don't necessitate having the same equipment that you used 20 years ago. So it's the same with, with volume shooting and it's the same with shooting on an FX3 the way that we did on the creator. It's the same with, you know, going forward. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for Unreal Engine and what's possible as filmmakers in in 3D and how we can make films in the future in a different way. And I'm all for that. Like I there's but having said that too, by the way, I'm not a techie and I don't even know how to program my phone. Like it's <laughs> it's it's more it's more about the fact that there are all these tools that are going to be good to tell stories with. And personally, I want to know about them so that when a director comes to me and says, how do we solve this problem, Greg? Then I can go, ah, well, you know, I did this film on the FX3. Maybe we use the FX3 in a gimbal and we go and do a little two-week shoot or, you know, or there's a volume. or like. So for me, the reason to do it isn't to be disruptive in any way because I, it's just so I can learn. I can have the knowledge that I need to be able to pass on to a, to a director when they come to me and tell me they want to do something a different way. I assure you that Alan Davio can make an incredibly beautiful image out of a DV camera, which he did way back in the early days of DV. He made this movie called Sweet, which is just like, it's mind-blowingly gorgeous, but he spent a ton of time figuring out how to do that. You can't mm. just go in, you know, well, a lot of people do. I, I'm not calling DPs out there lazy or anything, but there's a lot of people <laughs> who, they get familiar with their technology. They know what they can get away with. There's There's not a lot of like, broadening of minds or perspectives to actually figuring out what another piece of technology can do and be put in those same situations. Because, you know, if it doesn't have 15 stops of dynamic range, you can light to 13, you could light to 12. You have the control to figure out what this is going to be. And you know what your balance points is. Like if that's a natively daylight balance sensor, you know, if you give it more daylight balanced light, it's going to have a less, you know, less noisy image. There's all this stuff you can do. And so I'll get off my soapbox now, but, uh, but really, I, I just, I mean, DSLR cameras, mirrorless cameras, modest cameras have been intercut for years now. And in fact, uh, you know, if it really stood out to the audience, if it really stood out to people, they would have stopped doing it a long time ago. And just the base level of this technology has raised up so high that now, you know, even, there's there's still a huge difference between the $100,000 camera and the $4,000 camera. But the difference between what used to be a $100,000 camera and a $4,000, that's what shrunk. It's shrunk way, way down. So now you don't have that baseline of horribleness. That baseline has come up so much yeah. better that we're splitting hairs and we're talking about differences. And I think that this is really uh, all fascinating. I'll get up, like I said, I'll get off my soapbox It reminds now. me a little bit of, of yeah. what uh, our friend Fraser Bradshaw said uh, uh, to me like two years ago that he thought we were living in the days of peak sensor. That like <laughs> with, <laughs> with many cameras, a, uh, someone who's good at their job can get a great image. Like it, mm -hmm. it's not, you're not just locked into you must have you know the most expensive you 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 need the airy alexa you could you can accomplish it with so many different other ways and you know and uh it's interesting to hear and actually i want to hear about the decisions that kind of powered going for this ergonomic approach uh, and also like with gareth edwards like you know ordinarily a director would sit down with the dp and go over the coverage they wanted but if he knew what the coverage was did he go over it with you anyway so that you knew how to light to it and like what what was the collaboration with him like then yeah yeah it's a great question i mean I'll, also just to touch on the previous subject real quick like i'll add that the subjectivity is a big part of this because like for example the fx3 at 12800 iso is noisy like it has a noise floor it's yeah. it's surprisingly clean, shockingly clean for that ISO, but it's not crystal clean. Like there is a noise yeah, floor, of course. And and we just liked the noise. Like we, Greg, you know, we talked about it. Like we just it, for whatever reason, it looked filmic, 
And that's purely subjective. Like we just, we wanted the film to have a filmic look. We knew we were going to enhance it in post and we were either going to do a film out or do some sort of film, film emulation to kind of lean into that. We wanted it to be grainy and look like a 1970s, like a film that could have been shot in the 1970s. We, you know, our lensing choices leaned into that as well, like using uh, 1970s anamorphic glass, the Koa Cine Promenar. All of that was designed to like evoke that aesthetic. And there, there happened to be this element of the camera that some people would point to as a flaw and say, well, it's too noisy, can't use it. <laughs> but we like the noise level, you know? So like, that's just pure subjectivity. Um, yeah. In terms of Gareth, yeah, I mean, the process of, of shooting the film as in sort of like gathering the shots was really fascinating because Gareth, Gareth would, would show up every day with a shot list for the day but he wouldn't show it to anybody. <laughs> he would, um, it was on his phone, <laughs> like on, on the notes app. Mm. And it was really, it was really a reference for him. Like he didn't even really look at it much either. It was more, I think, just to make sure that he did his due diligence and his homework going into the day. And he's thought about the scene and the shot list also, it was not what you would, eventually I did, he did start showing it to me. But um, the, uh, the shot list was, it was not, this is why he didn't want to show it is because he kept emphasizing to everybody, like, this is not prescriptive. So this is not meant to be like, this is what we're getting today. And I'm hiding it to you just to like play games with you. That's not the point. The point was, is that Gareth wanted to shoot the film in this very organic way. And Gareth shoots in a very instinctive way. And um, it's, it's, it's very much, he's just, he's so ingrained in film language that for him moving the camera and what the camera's pointing at and what it's framing is very, um, it's very instinctual. Uh, and he's very much responding to his gut. So he didn't want to share the shot list because he didn't want people to start using it as, as dogma. But the shot list would be, it was more beats. It, it wasn't shots. It wasn't like start medium and then push into a close up on this character. Like it was more like Joshua and Alfie have a moment. Like that's a shot. So we need, we just need to make sure we get that moment or, you know, close up on this specific line of dialogue or wide shot um, following something in to kind of take us into the scene, like making sure he has his transitions in and out. So it was, it was more just to keep him on track of making sure that he's getting everything he needs. But him operating the camera meant that he does not need to spend, you know, half an hour of the day, like lecturing the entire crew about like, okay, well, here's the shots we're going to get. I'm going to do this, 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 and this, because he doesn't also necessarily know like what order it's going to be in, what's going to come first. He wants to shoot the film in a way that is reacting to the environment, reacting to what the actors are doing, reacting to how we've lit the, the set. It, it's very organic. It's, it's a little hard to explain because it's, it's, it varies from shot to shot or from scene to scene. Like sometimes it would be very, very prescribed and sometimes it would be completely loose, like full documentary style. Like no, he didn't even make a shot list intentionally for this scene because you want it to be completely spontaneous with the actors. So it, it just completely varied. And um, like some of our set pieces had storyboards, uh, the, the kind of action pieces, but- Yeah, I was gonna even, ask about that because you have, it's so VFX yeah. dependent. And, well, and I know that he himself is an amazing VFX artist, but like the, the fact that you could kind of shoot, not from the hip, but that, that he could be improvisational yeah. with something that's gonna later, you know, that shot might cost $20,000 because we, walked too far this direction or whatever, you know, like, yeah, but that was part of the approach of the VFX. They were, they were designed to the footage after we shot. So even the storyboards were more, it was just a reference. I think it was just to give people an idea of like, this is the general scope of what this scene could look like. And I think they were leftovers from the pitch. Like the storyboards were part of the pitch of the film. Mm. They weren't necessarily ever intended as like, we need to capture this sequence as it is boarded. It, it, it's actually quite the opposite because Gareth wants all of the sequences, including those action set pieces, to have that same organic energy and that that spontaneity. So it is kind of shooting from the hip. And, and we know that the VFX are being designed after the fact, and they're going to be designed to what we filmed. So that hmm. was all part of the way the film was was set up. Uh, but yeah, that's basically how it worked. And it, it's just more efficient. It's like Gareth, Gareth is just reacting to things in real time in his head. He doesn't have to communicate it to a an operator, he doesn't have to communicate it to me. And we have set up the sandbox for him to play in and for the actors to play in. That's how we lit the film. 
It was all. I was going to ask, like, what did, that, what did that mean for lighting? Did you have to light everything so he could move 360 degrees around everything and point the camera wherever he wanted, or essentially were you boxed in? No, no. I mean, essentially. Well, look, like, call it 270 degrees, you know, because every <laughs> location. The thing is, is when we scout a location, you can already start to identify, like, okay, well, we're not going to look back at this flat wall. There's no reason to look back there. Like, even if we light it, it's flat and uninteresting. And we know that the interesting part of the scene is going to be facing these windows that overlook the city of Bangkok, for example. So that already creates your arena, like, and creates some some limitations on it just by nature of what the location is giving you. And I think that that was always what we were reacting to was like, what is the natural light? Where are there already kind of really interesting looking practicals? Or where's the depth in this location? Where's the sun going to set? Like those were often the first questions that would then dictate like, okay, lighting wise, how much do we need to augment this? Like, do we need to take anything away from behind camera? We know we're not going to shoot this direction. So like, let's black, black this out so that we don't have any spill and we can focus on having the light be, you know, far side or whatever it is. So it was, it was really about lighting a space and creating the arena for Gareth to play in and then augmenting it on on a shot by shot basis with like some really small mobile LED lights, battery powered that we would like throw in the background or we had a Helios tube on a boom pole. Yeah, so that was really the approach. It was like a little bit of give Gareth an arena and and he's he finds the good light. Like this was the thing that we always talked about is like Gareth just he has a good eye for it. He knows where the good lighting is and he's not going to sh suddenly show up on the flat side of the light cuz he knows that looks bad. And, and if he does, it's because he needs that composition, like he needs that frame. So then I understand that what, looking at it, and then we can adjust the lighting accordingly to make that frame work. Um, so it was a little bit of him reacting to what we did, a little bit of us reacting to what he's doing, fully organic, totally collaborative, hard to delineate like a specific kind of prescribed approach. And that was part of the fun. Like that was the part of the exhilaration of the whole, the whole thing was was creating a film that way. It's like very organic. It's like growing, growing a film in a, in a pot of dirt, like in your, <laughs> in your backyard, like, and just tending it and watering it and shifting it so that it's facing the light a little bit better. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, one of the, one of the things that, that I've learned over the years is that sometimes we, well, we always have to work to our director's strengths. And there are times where you, you're on a film that maybe sometimes maybe the producers don't quite understand the director's strengths or, or they, they're not supporting them to, to enhance their strengths a lot, you know, like, so it's important. One thing with Gareth is I, we fully understand how he thinks. He thinks through that lens. He thinks better when he's holding a camera with a lens mm -hmm. on it. That's how he, he blocks his scenes in his mind. He doesn't necessarily storyboard. Yeah. As we said, there are some sequences that he did board just to get the VFX people off his back. So he could explain some things. Um, but it was more concept well, there, art. There are really. some big sequences, like some big Mama Jama giant <laughs> VFX Explosive. sequences where yes. there's just so much going on, you know, yeah, where the whole set's tilting and, you know, stuff like that, where it just, it, yeah. like, it's hard to believe that uh, it's it's not boarded. That's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, it, it's always nice to have some, an idea or a blocking idea when you're shooting in the volume. Like when you're designing a volume load, it's always nice to have an idea. So there were some times that I tried to get a little bit of more information out of Gareth about what he's at least thinking blocking wise, but it's just, just the way he thinks. I mean, I, I've recounted this story a few times, like on Rogue One, where we put him in one of the ships with five or six actors. It was supposed to be shooting Felicity. I asked him to show me through the headset what he's going to line up on so I could at least light it. And he did. And then action was called and he turned the camera around to face the other way. And, and it wasn't because it was being douchey about it he just realized that there was performance going on over his shoulder that he wanted to capture and he didn't warn me about that so you know outside the ship as orange just said it's quite exhilarating it's like going oh quick <laughs> dim that down like like three dim up like it was, mm -hmm. it was like a it was like a something had gone wrong on a stage show and you have to make it make amends for it every minute that's exciting it's fun it's a different way of working I'm glad that we're talking about the VFX because a lot's being made right now, I would say, sort of in the traditional sort of mainstream uh, media about the production of the creator that this should have been a 250 or $300 million movie based on the VFX. And the technique, again, going back to what's you know, what's old is new again. This, is, this isn't exactly new, but 
the production made huge use of 2.5D rather than actually rendering 3D for all of the graphics. So this is going back to the idea of, you know, of matte paintings, matte paintings on glass and like digital matte paintings that came in, you know, in the, in the 90s and things like that. So not having to render out full 3D worlds and environments and knowing your elements and just using those elements and then projecting essentially your digital art now onto a 3D form that then matches into the world so you don't have to create everything. And then working from your final edit, working from the movie and only creating your shots as needed versus creating all that stuff so you have a previs but by working off of green. This is economical. If you are making a movie like the creator and you are looking to maximize your budget, I'm going to call it right now and say that this is like the money ball of VFX. Like people who have not, who, who are not paying attention to this and are wondering like, wow, how did they, how were they able to pull off so much with so little? This is the money ball. This is the saber metrics. They, you guys have figured out exactly what you need and granted people have been doing this for a long time, but you guys did it in a new way and that you figured out exactly what you need and added it just to that and didn't have a bunch of wasted. VFX and people working really hard, trying to, to, to struggle and grind out the hours for shots that will never be seen ever. And that's, that's great. That's brilliant. I, I, I think that your, your team working this way, of course, you were able to put so much value up on the screen. Uh, talk a little bit about your, like your onset process. Was there tracking marks involved? Was there ever a piece of green that was flown in or was it really a hundred percent? We're just going to do it on top and we're going to figure it out. Yeah, it was, I, I, I mean, here's the thing, big picture also, just to back up, I, I'm a, I'm a big visual effects nerd. I've always been like an, like an industrial light and magic nerd since I was a kid. Like I loved Star Wars and all that. Same here. So yeah, I grew up with all those behind the scenes and seeing the history of ILM and how involved it was with Star Wars, big part of why I, I went into filmmaking. So I think uh, like a key component here is there's, there's two really key things that make this work. Yeah. You need a director who knows what they want which is a lot, sometimes a lot to ask yes, for. It, like or that is, impossible, yes. <laughs> so, so, so that's step one, you need somebody like Gareth. And then step two is you need, ILM just have the most talented artists in the business. Um, only and, that. <laughs> yes. Only ILM, no one else employs anyone talented. Is what you're yeah. Saying. No. And, and yeah, ex I can only well, speak but, to I mean, ILM because I haven't, because we worked with them on this. You know, I, you I go obviously. Back to Monsters and like that was, that was how. Well, that Gareth was Gareth in his, and, uh, yeah. and he did it all the VFX himself. He, he did it by himself. So this is, this is true is, is that, you know, I guess the big picture thing is you need the, you need extremely talented artists in order to pull this off. And, and they exist elsewhere. They exist in, in their own bedroom. Uh, as we've seen a lot of times over the last few years, there's been like people that have popped up and made, you know, like visual effects driven shorts by themselves and, and are doing amazing work. There's obviously like unbelievable artists at Weta Digital and everything they, they did with Avatar and, and going back before that, Lord of the Rings, et cetera. So, but on this film, like James Klein, our production designer who came out of ILM, he was a concept artist. And then Charmaine and all the supervisors and all the artists that worked on this, they're geniuses, like they're just brilliant. So those are, those are two elements that I think you need in place. And I think the director who knows what they want is the important one <laughs> um, and who, who knows it when they see it and is not gonna start like wasting anybody's time over iterating something and who also understands the visual effects process. So when they're asking for, like you said, like, no, 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 we don't need to do a 3D model for this background. Like, let's just do a, let's just do a two and a half D. And by the way, there's some, there's some full on 2D matte paintings in the film too that aren't even tracked. Like deep background stuff is not even projected onto geometry. It's just a 2D um, image. That's like maybe there's a little bit of parallax. Very old school. Um, yeah, that's it's the best matte paintings. And yeah. if you and if you if you can force the perspective, if you put your camera in the right spot, you can even get away with a little bit of movement, and no one will ever know. Oh, it's, that's it's exactly right. It's past a certain distance of of in the background. The parallax is so infinite that you just need to slide it over a little bit, and the illusion works. So there is a lot of that in the movie actually that they, that they get away with. And now, now obviously, there's also a lot of like really beautifully intricate 3D modeling in the foregrounds the robots, the ships, all that stuff. And the lighting that they did on that is like impeccable. And they matched our, our set lighting perfectly. What it looked like on set was we had Andrew Roberts from ILM. He was our onset VFX soup. He was kind of uh, on his own. <laughs> like there was not a big onset visual effects team. It was really Andrew and he had an assistant. And his job 
more than anything was just to gather information. Like he was getting HDRIs and he was getting reference images of every location. Basically all of it is just gathering as much information about the light that was on set in the moment so that it can then be recreated for the 3D models that are gonna be tracked onto. But yeah, so it was it was a really small footprint for visual effects on set. And, 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 and more importantly, the visual effects did not drive any of the decisions that we made in a way that would like bog the shoot down. Do you know what the total number of shoot days was for the movie? 90. 90 shoot days. days. Not bad. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually... That movie, I have to say, brisk. like it, it felt yeah. like uh, when, I, when it was over, I felt like I'd watched the entire Star Wars trilogy all crammed into one, into one movie. Like there, I was <laughs> like thinking about it afterwards, like how much just narrative, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 tr- the narrative track of it and how, how many beats and how many scenes and how many set pieces and it just feels like there's so much in that movie there's it's it's dense in a in a great way like it's just it's quite a it, it's quite a, a trip for one movie to take you to all uh, through that whole story so many you know you feel like a different person on the other side of it really yeah do you feel like a different different person now coming out the other side Oren, for you personally like you know did, did, were your expectations completely you know shattered how 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 is you know your first gigantic movie of this scale now how are you now on the other side of it how have you changed Yeah I mean the whole thing was really a life-changing experience not just from a filmmaking standpoint but also just the people that we met, the crew that we worked with in Thailand, like the friends we made along the way, like the, the, the we were all just thrown together in this pot with Gareth stirring the, mm. the, 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 the big spoon. And, you know, we shot in 80 locations all over Thailand. It's a road movie and we were all over the place, constantly moving, constantly seeing different sides of the country and trying different food. And like just the whole experience of it was so memorable and so distinct that like that is as much a takeaway for me as the filmmaking part of it and the the sort of end result of the movie. But yeah, I'm just like super grateful for all of it and I'm really proud of the movie. I think we're all really we're all very proud of the movie. Gareth is a very rebellious kind of person and and in 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 a good way, I think. Just just constantly questioning things and trying things and is very open. And I'm very inspired by that. I'm inspired by Greg's sort of equal willingness to to do that and to um, reflect those values. And, and I just, uh, I think it's, I love the movie. I, I've, I've been a sci-fi nerd and, and a <laughs> movie geek my whole life. And so to be able to make something like this and something original, not based on IP, was, it was really, really something. That's about all I can say about that. <laughs> well, bravo. I think that is a fantastic note to leave it on. I think this mm-hmm. was, was so much fun. Uh, I, I'm really glad that we got to, I know we were long overdue, but I'm really glad that we got to do this. And I think it's wonderful that we got to do it with, uh, with you and Greg, but especially as, uh, for your debut on our show. I think this is just, this is, uh, this is a wonderful conversation. I'm, I'm so glad. Thank, thanks for being on. Yeah. yeah, thanks. I, I mentioned this offline, but I'm a longtime listener, so I'm very honored to be on the show. And that and always hopefully... blows my mind. <laughs> Every time. Yeah, I know. Su- surprise, surprise. People listen to the podcast. Quite a few, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you guys do a great job. So it was. Uh, uh, yeah, this was great. I can't wait to be on again. Well, uh, before we go, if uh, is there any place where people can see your work online or interact with you, social media? Like, wh- where would you like to send people online? Are if you they an want to Instagrammer? See more Yes, I'm, I'm very active on Instagram. Uh, people who follow me there know, probably to a fault. But uh, yeah, Oren Sofer DP <laughs> on Instagram. And I do have a website as well, uh, orensofer.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Oren. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks again. All right, so that was uh, Greg and Oren. Hey, thanks so much for being on the show. It was a great conversation. And uh, Oh, my God. Yeah, it, it, it was so much fun, and I, you're not going to have a long By the way, we should say, that for, for audiences who, uh, we didn't mention it in, during the interview, but uh, uh, Greg had to, had, he was working, he was shooting and taking time out, so he kind of vanished about 45 minutes into the into our time. I don't know where that time's out after it's edited, but, uh, so so that's that's why Greg disappeared. I'm so glad that he uh, was able to uh, to steal away, you know, better part of an hour to hop on this, this podcast with us. It was a lot of fun. So, All thank right. you, Greg.
And uh, thank you, Oren. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this podcast coming out and hearing way more uh, from more people about the creator. It's only been out for a couple of weeks now, and I'm sure that there's a lot more people who are going to see it. I know it's made back about two thirds of the money already, and I think that this movie will uh, will will uh, do well. So I can't wait. I think to it's got really... legs, and I also think people are going to it's it's one of those movies people are going to talk about and reference like it's got such a unique look and vibe and feel. And uh, and I'm glad we got to see it. You and I got to see it on a big screen. Yeah, go see the movie on the big screen. I think that if if you're interested in the creator, then then definitely go see it on a big screen. You'll, you'll yeah. appreciate it. And if you're interested only really from the, the technical capabilities too, which it seems like there's a few people out there that it's are, go see it on the big screen because that is how you actually you oh my understand god yeah and learn you'll, and you'll never have a better out. way to evaluate it. So so Ben, you know what time it is? I do, but I'll let you say it. All right, it is. It is the, it's the way we pay for this show. We, 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 we pay for the production of the show is we have sponsors. And our, our, our really good friends, Ari. I was selling plasma. How, how, uh, this is how we pay <laughs> for the show? Oh, my God. <laughs> we've, we've been selling advertising. We have a little segment oh. of the show here where we Man, talk about. Man, that's way better than blood plasma. Yeah, it's so much better. Uh, our friends at Aerie have an incredible new light that is coming out called the Sky Panel X. It was introduced just a few weeks ago, and uh, actually at Hot Red Cameras, we have an event coming up in November next month where we are told we are going to have a Sky Panel X. I think it's going to be November 17th, just before Thanksgiving, about the, the, the Friday before the week of Thanksgiving. If you are in the LA area and you want to check out the Sky Panel X, you can come on down to Hot Red. We should have it there. We've been promised, fingers crossed, that the prototype one that has entered the country or a final version that's coming in from Germany will be at our event. But the Sky Panel X is a native hard light. They call it also a native soft light. It's got a soft diffusion that can go on top of this light as well. And uh, it's modular and waterproof. It's IP66 rated, so you can stack them on top of each other. It has full remote controls. It is a very, very bright light. And let me tell you, Aerie does not make uh, unimpressive lighting technology. Their stuff is deeply, deeply impressive in a fundamental way. And they have some really, really great Aerie channel YouTube videos, which can go into tons of detail, far more detail, far more time than, than we can take on, on our show here. There's a 13 minute video called the Sky Panel X Premiere. And rather than me tell everyone and show everyone right now what that all is, I'm going to encourage you to go check out the Sky Panel X Premiere video on YouTube, where, you know, if you're watching this, if you're watching Ben and I talk right now, you're already on YouTube. You can open up another window, you can watch the Sky Panel X Premiere, and you'll get to learn all about the light. And of course, if you want to buy the light, make sure you come to the other sponsor of the show, Hot Rod Cameras. We can sell you the Sky panel x i'm sure we have a pre-order deposit or something going on right now so so yeah that that's about it and now short ends uh ben it is our famed short end time of the show we talk about our obsession of the week what are you all about this week what what's what's going on with you uh i learned a new thing this week and it's uh a, a bit of technology and it's called a gaussian splat or a g splat are you familiar with this i am not it's uh, kind of a new-ish thing in VFX, so it's not a Quixel, it's not a mesh. Uh, it's a way to capture a, a physical image. It's a way to, uh, not a physical image, but, a, but like a 3D environment or a 3D object. And there's a channel that I watch on YouTube sometimes that's these two brothers. We can uh, post to it, uh, we can link to it in the show notes uh, up in Canada. And they did a series of videos about capturing g splats uh the 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 name of their channel by the way is bad decisions studio uh and they're they're very entertaining and they kind of show how to do this stuff but they were able to take like drone footage of the pyramids at giza and also i guess they're up in uh, canada i think it was toronto they were able to take drone footage of, of toronto and load it into this thing and they were able to pull a G, they were able to pull it basically a fully 3D environment version of it, and it's editable too. Because like uh, sometimes the sky or whatever kind of shows up as like weird planes that interfere with everything. But they, uh, and then they were able to bring it into their 3D uh, program of choice. They uh, do a lot of stuff in Unreal Engine, and you know uh, if you were just listening to this interview, you were hearing Greg Fraser talk about Unreal Engine and the possibilities within it and like I'm watching what these guys are doing and uh you know with mild adjustments I'm like totally seeing that if you were making a movie and you just had a $1200 drone that you ran through every exterior set that you filmed in 
uh, or you know, took a bunch of pictures of every interior set. You could generate G splats of virtually everything that you did, and oh wow, kind of make up new shots. If you had uh, needed a, an establishing shot of that location, and you had a drone shot, you could, and you're like, man, I wish it was drifting from you know camera left to camera right, or I wish it was zooming out instead of, or not zooming, but droning in rather than out. What it, whatever it was. You could get that, and also uh, Polycam, and I know I've talked about Polycam on here. Polycam can export stuff as G splat, so you could like you know take a picture of a Coke can or a you know a house plant or whatever it was, and you can put those into scenes. I don't I don't know that the technology is a hundred percent there to make it absolutely flexible yet, but looking at what Bad Decision Studio was doing with it, I was like, mm, I think it's reasonably close and uh depending on what you wanted to do like i i have a film that may or may not happen we'll see uh coming up soon it, if it happens like I'm, I'm like wondering like do we should we have a drone and a drone operator that just films every exterior location after we leave so that we have more flexibility to make more stuff out of what we have you know l- later on so for people who are more in tune with this stuff, feel free to reach out to me and correct me on what I'm talking about. But uh, I think it's a very interesting direction that 3D technology is going into. And what's great about it is it is freaking photo real. It's, mm. you know, I, I love when this technology can be used not to create something that looks super stylized or I mean, there, there are obviously great times for that. But when you can make something that just looks like you could walk up to it and touch it and pick it up. And the reason you can is because it's sampling something that is a real thing. It's not it's, it's not all, all made up in, in CGI in the computer. Anyway, that's that's my obsession. It Ilya, what awesome. is your, what is your obsession this week? Huh. OK, so I flew to Atlanta on Thursday last week and Really, my short end is about uh, what I did on Sunday, right before I flew back. Uh, I was in Atlanta for Cinegear Atlanta, and uh, we'll I'll, we'll cover you know I'll cover some of the like the the really really interesting stuff that went on there uh, while I was there. But uh, during Cinegear, I met someone named Richard Jones, and Richard Jones is the father of uh, Sarah Jones. Uh, Sarah Elizabeth Jones is, mm. of course, the tragic. Uh, well, she's she's uh, the tragic example for this industry. And uh, she was killed during the making of the movie Midnight Rider. Very famously, she got uh, hit by the train that was on the uh, mm. trestle. That was that that uh, a whole lot of people, seven people, were were injured during that. But uh, tragically, she uh, she was killed. And um, meeting Richard Jones, it, it was a it was a sort of powerful experience to get to talk to him because uh, you and I both know people who have died in the you know working in this industry while they while they we were both working. know the same guy who died you know we both know the same guy and and other people too and i i would be remiss if i didn't mention you know neil fredericks and helena hutchins and and you know they're they're, they're not the only ones there's a lot of pe- there's a lot of people who needlessly uh passed away on on set due to um negligence we, we yeah, negligence, yeah. negligence absolutely at least in those two cases for sure and um Look, it was uh, he, he. There was an event going on. He's got. A, he founded a nonprofit organization called Safety for Sarah. And on October eighth, yesterday, uh, they had this event they called the Field Day, which they invited people to come out and uh, to remember. Really, that like there's something that that's good that can come out of these tragedies. There, there's something good. There can be like systemic change in the industry where people don't just give lip service to safety. They really pay very close attention and the people who are responsible for everyone's safety on set or who should be responsible are really taking that seriously. And it was a great outpouring of people who all got together and are striving to make sure that the work that is happening on set in professional production, and really it should be in all levels of production, is safe for the people that are there because this is should not be that level of dangerous work, but sometimes, especially when it comes to stunts, especially when it comes to filming on location, a lot of this work c- could be absolutely dangerous if someone is negligent. That negligence costs lives. It costs, it's it's uh, it's something that I don't think that enough people really do think about in their day-to-day being. And for some, for some people who have lived through this or were personally touched by it, I don't think they can help but ever, but they can't help but be reminded of it constantly. But I think it's everyone's responsibility to see something, say something. And if you're moving into anything that is the 
the least bit dangerous, there has to be the the right amount of safety training. And, mm-hmm. you know, look, we, we don't need any more examples. We don't need any more Sarah's. We don't need any more Helena's. We don't need any more Neil's or Brent's. I mean, really, any, any of the other people out there who is, I mean, I don't know what it is about camera department, like camera department in particular, this, this shouldn't be a life and death. It shouldn't be a life and death decision to go to work in the morning. And, uh, it's it's sadly happened way too many times that yep. uh, someone has has given their life in the pursuit of, of of art for you know collective art and I know that the projects end up in some some ways being you know because a lot of these projects you know they 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 still move forward and go into the world I mean I know that uh, Midnight Rider did not but that's sort of it seems like the exception but so, Rust is you know yeah. they're 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 coming back and finishing it yeah. So I mean, Midnight, Midnight Rider not only didn't come back but the director and producer both went to jail. That's right. And um, although the director had a new movie recently and I'm like, really? I, I think it was made in Europe or something. I, I didn't. I, the whole I was yet. shocked yeah. that 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 guy got to make another movie after. Like, I'm sorry. I mean, I guess, I, you know, you can't say uh, that you're not allowed to make a living ever again. But, you know, like, yeah. uh, I, I mean, you know, if, if a freak accident happened, you know, a meteor crashed on your set and it wasn't anyone's we, fault. That's one we thing. We understand but, that. I think everyone understands that. There's some yeah. things that are, you know, acts of God. They're beyond, they're beyond control. Yeah. But, but the Midnight Rider thing was a terrible, fatal, awful decision that no, that no one should have been okay with on that incredibly, set. Pre- incredibly preventable. Highly, Just highly preventable. Rec- so. Reckless as all hell and, you know, ended up killing someone. So anyway. So, yeah, anyway, I, I didn't mean to, to bring this episode down to this sort of like, you know, this, this, this note, but I do think it's important. And, you know, I, I really think that the, the reminder, that constant reminder uh, should be out there. And I yeah. really applaud uh, Richard Jones for what he's doing. And uh, uh, like, you know, it, I, it can't be easy for him to dedicate his life to, to doing this you know, this, this sort of work now, uh, but he, he lives in that space every single day. And I, and you know, he's a crusader and I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful and, uh, Im- important. And I'm, I'm super glad that he's doing it. We'll put links to that in the show notes over at camnoir.com along with everything else that we talked about in this episode. And, uh, yeah, if you, um, if you, if you found this show interesting, if you thought that this was, uh, uh, you know, something that, that added value to your life, you know, please be sure to give a thumbs up or tell someone about this or subscribe. I guess now we have to do this. And so if we're doing a YouTube channel or a YouTube do we, show, we don't have to tell people we, to smash the like button. Do we, do we have to tell no, them to smash no, the like button? Oh and you so, can del- delicately tap the like button. You, you don't need to, I, de- I don't want anyone hurting their phone. And yeah, they don't have to hurt their fingers. Uh, ben, uh, where can people find you outside of this podcast if they want to track you down? Is there a place you exist online? Is there, a, is there anything? Uh, yeah, go check me out at benrock.com. You can uh, find everything you ever wanted to know and way more about me at benrock.com. And it's uh, got my reel and social media links. And uh, oh, uh, and I recently found out that my movie Alien Raiders is streaming for free on Tubi. I put a link for that on, on benrock.com. Uh, but if you have to be go, 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 uh, watch alien Raiders and tell me if you liked it or hated it. I can take it. It's been so long. You can, I'll, I'll, I'll it won't, it won't hurt me. It won't hurt my feelings. Uh, Ilya, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over at uh, Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. That is uh, my camera shop where we sell all manner of, you know, camera equipment, lighting equipment, sound equipment. We sell it to uh, professionals and aspiring professionals. Uh, a lot of people in the creator economy have actually been finding us lately. We've built now several studios for for creators, that sort of thing. And actually, I just discovered too that a movie that I produced, the, the last movie that I produced a few years ago, Concrete Kids is now oh, streaming I on it's streaming on Tubi and a bunch of services. So there's it's there's a bunch of them out there now showing Concrete Kids. And, so. and Tubi, yeah. if you don't know, it's free. It's ad supported. So you don't need to log into anything or sign into anything or you just download it on your smart tv and start to be in it up yeah your roku or whatever it is so ben we gotta thank some people it wasn't just us that made this today who do no. we have to thank <laughs> we have to thank alana who was all over this interview because this interview got set up in a big old hurry it did. um yeah uh so thanks alana cody our our intrepid producer who has this and many other awesome interviews coming up uh we got to thank uh, ben Katz, our editor, who now also has to edit video. Sorry, Ben. Sorry, you have to look at my 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 office and my face. Um, and uh, we should also thank uh, Kay's Alatracci, who composed every scrap of music. I think it's only fair that we get Kay's on video making the music every time you hear it. You should just have a shot of him at his at his computer uh, or you know tickling the ivories. 
I'd love that. Yeah, I think we definitely got to get a little BTS footage of uh, yeah. Kay's, you know, make make it making magic happen. But you got to uh, please go check out Kay's website, musicbykays.com. Hire him to score your next movie, for God's sakes. Do that, for sure. Ben, you want to take us out? Thanks for listening and watching. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.